this was the level to which the, the dead body would no longer attack people. Now, how did they figure that out? Empirically, right? We buried bodies a little bit shallowly. No, people still die. Okay, try a little bit lower. Right? And eventually they hit some point where, okay, this seems to be working. So that's a horrible thing to have to go through. The only sort of advantage, I guess, is that you know they had many, many, many years to figure this out. That got figured out, and then it, it got into culture. Right? Well, a really good way to kind of you know communicate with your descendants is religion. Right? If you can put a burial practice, say, in a religion, and then people just practice that religion, they effectively are learning it by rote. Right? Say, so, okay, well, I just know that I'm supposed to you know, bury a body six feet deep, or you know, not eat pork because pigs are infected with diseases. Right? So things like that. There's lots and lots of stuff that kind of gets into culture, gets into religion, and gets into kind of all our, our societal practices, and they just kind of get fixed there. And then this can, of course, be very different for different cultures. So, for example, Ebola. Right? So Ebola. Ebola has been around for a very long time, but in places like the Congo, and in the Congo, the death practices there, they're well adapted to Ebola, right? You, you basically don't spend any time with dead bodies. You know, if somebody dies, they're, they're taken care of very quickly. And in other places where there was historically not been any Ebola, when the Ebola outbreak in 2014 happened, it's because somebody flew from the Ebola infected region to I think, Sierra Leone and spread it around in sort of you know, West Guinea and so on. And the burial practices there are very, very different. So, so we, Places like that, the, the day that you die is the most important day of your life. And so, when, when your relative has died, what do you do? You go and you, you know, not only pay your respects, like you pay your respects in a very intimate way. So, people are, you know, washing bodies, they're putting fingers into orifices, there's, there's a very, very close contact with the body, and this is very important, right? This is a very, very strong cultural practice. And so, when the World Health Organization said, uh, perhaps do not do that with the infected of all the bodies, People, people are not going to listen and say, no, that's, this is, this is my, my, you know, they're the loved one, I have to do the most important thing for them, I have to honor them and you know, send them on to the next life and so on. And it's very, very hard to stop. And in fact, it often didn't stop. And then more people get infected from the dead bodies. So I do things like zombies as a, as a fun thing, but, you know, in zombies, of course, the dead are infecting you. That's also true of Ebola. Right? So things are, you know, the dead bodies are not getting up and chasing you around, but they are also infectious. And actually, it's, you know, quite tragic because you know, people go to funerals of, of their dead loved ones, and then the bodies infect them, and then there's more funerals, and this cascades out. Right? So there's all kinds of things, and something like Ebola is a really awful disease to catch. Right? If you catch Ebola, it's not pleasant for you. Right? So that's a really unfortunate measure of disease. But that's not what I'm talking about. So I'm talking about actual sheer numbers of, of dead. Um, and Ebola, in that sense, is a pretty mild disease. It actually doesn't infect that many people. Right? Now, we sort of understand Ebola is a scary disease in large part because of the media. And I think the media is one of those things that you have to also take into account when thinking about disease. Because the media, they love a good disease. Right? But there's a there's a new outbreak or something. I mean, if you think fundamentally about the media, what are they doing? They're, you know, they like a couple of human interest stories that kind of look like a pattern. Whether they are or aren't, that's irrelevant, right? It's like, you know, somebody's infected, somebody else infected, you know, like, you know, Grandma dies of this disease, like small child's infected, like you know, pregnant mom. Right? These are great human interest stories. Right? Thirty thousand people dying of the flu a year in the US. Ah, that's that's a boring story. We don't we don't tell that story. Right? So we tell a story about a few few you know people of interest, and and that makes perfect sense because as humans, we can't think about thirty thousand people. That's that's not a number we can hold in our head in any meaningful way. We can think about you know, oh, there's this you know, pregnant woman died. That's that's very sad. Right? And so you, you you engage on the level you engage on, but the media. Of course, can influence behavior, and behavior influences the media, and you get this very complicated feedback loop. Uh, for example, uh, there was an outbreak of plague in India uh, about 20 years ago, and it was in one province in India, and the media said, oh my god, there's plague in India, right? Well, what happened? Everybody said, ah, there's plague in that province, they fled the province. What did they do? They took the plague all across India, right? What did the media do? They said, oh no, there's plague all across India, right? So, <laughs> so th these things become feedback loops, and that, that's also very complicated. Uh, so, the media, of course, do focus on, on disease deaths. So often, the big diseases, they have a lot of deaths associated with them. So they sometimes get attention. So sometimes tropical diseases that kill a lot of people will get attention, and I've heard, heard much called out here. Um, the, the sort of more minor ones don't. Uh, so we will get into the top 10, but I'm, I'm going to tell you about a couple of uh, sort of my favorite diseases. Um, so does anyone know guinea worm disease? Cool. OK, so who, who has heard of guinea worm disease? Awesome. OK. This is way better numbers than I usually deal with. Usually like, nah, nah, no, 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 you're weird disease. Um, so, yeah, I suspect we have a slightly more educated crowd than average here, so this is awesome. Um, so, guinea worm disease is a parasite in the drinking water. Right? 
So it's the only disease that is spread solely by drinking water. So there are, there are many other diseases where there's parasites in the drinking water, but they also spread through different ways. And so this one is a parasite, lives on a water flea, and the water flea is floating around the water. And so you, you drink the water, and you, the flea is very small. So you swallow, swallow the flea with the parasite in it, and your stomach acid dissolves the flea, but not the parasite. So now you've got a parasite in you, and it can go anywhere in your body, but it tends to go down, because gravity sends it downwards, and it goes generally down into the foot. And so you've got this parasite living in your foot. So it goes into the muscle cavity there, and it spends about a year in your foot growing into a worm. And so you get this worm that's, that's stuck in your muscle cavity, and then after about a year, your foot is burning and itching, and you think, I really must put my foot in the water. Right? And so you, you're driven to go find the source of water, put your foot in, and the worm, which is itching you at the, at the edge of your foot, will burst out into the water, um, or just the head pops out, and it sprays for 100,000 new parasites. Right? So now you've reinfected the water. If that's your drinking water, you've just restarted the whole cycle. Right? And in many, many remote places, there's one source of water in the village, and that's you know, that's the only thing there is, so that this is why these, these cycles get maintained. So, well, you've now started the cycle, so now there's new parasites which will go and attach to fleas, which then can, can be drunk by the next person. And, and the delay of a year is really problematic because, you know, you might think you've eradicated this, and then, well, you know, eight months later it pops up again because it's just been hiding in people. So you have to account for that stuff. Um, but also you have a worm living in your foot, right? So the, the head of the worm has popped out, and the worm is stuck in it. The worm can grow to up to a meter long. So a meter is about that long. So you have this very long, very skinny worm. It's like a long noodle. Um, it's curled up into your foot, and you have to get it out because you can't really walk properly, and so that means you can't work. And so you've got to get this thing out. Now, surgery will take care of that. Almost nobody who has this worm has access to surgery, so that's not really on the table. So the other way to get it out is to take something like this. You take a stick, right, and you wind the worm basically around the stick, and you can get like one to two centimeters a day. Right, so like half an inch, maybe, right? and you're very slowly winding the worm out, and you kind of inch this worm out over a period of two months. So you very slowly kind of pull this out, and eventually get the worm out. Now the good news is the worm is not disabling. Uh, sorry, it's not, it's not deadly. It's disabling. So it's no good having the worm in you. But once you get the worm out, you can have it out. You can have multiple worms. Um, I think people have up to seven worms at a, at a given time. So, but you can get them out using this kind of old school method. And this idea of saying, like, you know, well, you can get your worm out with a stick. Um, a, a stick with a, a worm wrapped around it, if you look on the thing there, that's basically the medical symbol. Right? The medical symbol is a stick with a worm. Right? Well, they added the wings later, um, and it looks a bit like snakes. That's because they, they originally thought, oh, these are fiery serpents, they thought there were many snakes in your feet. Um, at least since I'm here, I'll show you a great tattoo that I got. I got, I got a tattoo of, well, not really the worm. I kind of got the medical symbol, but actually I got a math symbol instead. So, so I kind of decided that, that was my, my kind of thing. Because, you know, I feel like that's, that's my acknowledgement of disease modeling. That's also my song title. <laughs> okay, so. Obviously, this, this, this worm, it's found its way to culture. Right? So that's because it's very old. Egyptians and mummies have it. Uh, it's mentioned in the Bible. This thing was not everywhere, but it was everywhere in the tropical regions. So all the warm regions of the past and so on. Um, and this disease is almost gone. Right? So this disease has almost been eradicated. And there is no cure, there is no treatment, there is no immunity. So what happened to this disease? It will be the next disease to be eradicated, almost certainly within maybe five years, I would say. Um, what happened? How do you get rid of such a disease? Okay, I'm going to ask a different question. Who? Who got rid of this? And it turns out there's one guy, one guy who you may know of, which you probably most of the crowd will know. Um, one guy decided, I'm going to get rid of the disease from the planet. So the question is, who has the power to do that? Right, now I think you know, as I say, hang on. Uh, does anyone know who this is? Yes, a couple of people? Yeah, so Bill Gates sounds like a likely candidate. I would say Bill Gates is kind of the next generation of, of this guy. Um, so a little bit further back. He's still alive. Warren Buffett, good guess. All right, so someone who knows, want to say? Jimmy Carter. Yes, Jimmy Carter. So, so in, in 1986, after, after being president, he basically, you know, well, he got a lot of, kind of, you know, people talking to people over the world and knew about this disease. But he basically decided this is going to be his pet project. And so he, you know, created the Carter Center, which is a way of, um, Basically, you know, interfacing with local communities. Right? Now, you know, Jimmy Carter is not a virologist. Jimmy Carter did not invent the vaccine. Right? So Jimmy Carter is a politician, fundamentally. You know, 
politician slash humanitarian. And what does he do? He does what politicians do best. They go and talk to people. Right? And so actually by educating people and talking to people, well, they determined a couple of things. So they said, that how, do, how can you interrupt this disease cycle? Right? There's a couple of ways. One is don't drink the, the water. Right? Well, of course, you have to drink some water. But you can put cloth filters over, over your pot. And so you pour the water through the cloth filter. The, the mesh of the filter is, is you know, fine enough that the flea can't get through the mesh. So you basically collect the fleas and then carefully dispose of the fleas somewhere else. This is great if you live in a village and we can give you cloth filters. Okay? But what if you don't? What if you're nomadic and so you're wandering around? Right, well, they gave people pipes, so they had these, these pipes around the neck, and they put a mesh on the end of the pipe, the pipes on the string, and so they can drink through the, through the pipe. So you come to a water source you don't know, and you basically drink, drink through the pipe, well, it stops the water flea, but it also stops all kind of junk in the water, because if you're a nomadic and you find a water source, you have to drink because you need to survive, but you don't know what you're drinking in there. So that's been good for general health, that will probably continue um, even after the guinea worm is eradicated. Um, so another option you can do is you can treat the water, so they, they put chemicals in the water and you try and kill the parasite or kill the water flea in the water. Um, that's, that's another method, of course you have issues of resource allocation, so does, does the resource turn up in time? Um, and if not, well you just kind of have to wait until it does. Um, you have issues of toxicity, so if you use too much of this chemical then you're making the water toxic. So you can't do it all the time, and you can't do it too little. Um, so that's kind of the most westernized uh, possibility that they have. Um, it's, not that great. I mean, it works to some degree, but it's, not, it's, it's the least effective of the methods. Um, but the other method, the one that works probably the best, is basically teaching people about the cycle and say, well, this is, this is what the disease is, this is how it works. And if you don't put your foot in the water, this is the same drinking water, then you save the next people. And so, well, if you can have two water sources, one is for the guinea worm and one is for the drinking water, and they never mix, you can basically say, okay, if your foot is burning and itching, go to that water source, not this one. And that turns out to be a great method. And so, you know, a simple kind of, you know, soft science methods like this turn out to be quite effective. Um, so it involves understanding how, how things work. Um, it involves interfacing with local communities in culturally appropriate ways. Right? It's not enough to just go and tell people what to do. Right? That, is, that is not an effective method of communication. Um, and so, and, and we've seen this in other diseases, like for example, HIV AIDS. I'd right? say, so, well, just don't have unprotected sex. Right? It's not so simple because there's a whole history of kind of the West you know, interfering in kind of population, um, you know, uh, control and stuff like that. And so people say, yes, yes, but you've tried to sterilize us in the past, so why should we listen to you now? Uh, and fair enough, right? So you have to actually, you know, talk, talk in ways that are going to work and, you know, realize that, that there, there's going to be, you know, a big drive towards people wanting to have babies. How are you going to interface that with you, you know, also don't want to infect people with HIV? So lots of complicated conversations have to happen and lots of kind of understanding of what actual practices are. Um, so, for example, with Ebola and the burial practices, uh, they, you know, during, during the Ebola outbreak, people were stealing dead bodies from hospitals right? because they said, you know, you, you've taken away my, my loved one and I need to bury this person properly and we need to do all the rituals. And, and the, you know, World Health Organization is saying, like, please don't take the Ebola body away. It's very infectious. And people were anyway. There was a standoff um, about a pregnant woman who died. So, so the fetus is still inside her and the cultural practice was you have to cut open the, the pregnant woman, take the fetus and bury it separately. So they'd say, one grave over here, one grave over there. And the World Health Organization was like, no way, we're not cutting open an Ebola-infected body and burying the, the fetus separately. They said, no, we have to. And there was a huge standoff. And eventually it was decided, okay, we, we can do this compromise. We will bury a goat in the name of the fetus. And so we'll bury her with the fetus over here and bury the goat over here. And three months later, we'll come and dig her up and then cut her open and take the fetus out and bury it where the goat was. And they said, this is acceptable. Right, so that, that was because, because three months is long enough for the virus to have, to have um, faded away. So you know, if you can understand these kind of things and kind of interface in that way, then this really helps. Okay, so let me kind of talk a bit maybe about some of the diseases that were named. Um, what I'm going to go through is kind of the, the top ten, um, I, guess, I guess in order. So let's maybe do our sort of number ten. Um, well, I guess I'll just do some summaries here. So I've mentioned this before. Uh, I'm talking about infectious diseases. So I'm not talking about genetic diseases. Right? So um, now some infectious diseases do cause cancer. So um, uh, hepatitis B, uh, that causes liver cancer. Um, human papilloma virus, that causes cervical cancer, and also some penile cancers and anal cancers. So some of it is related. And actually we have vaccines against some of these diseases, which means we actually have two vaccines against cancer. Right? That's not really kind of as well known as I think it should be. Um, the fact that we can vaccinate against some cancers is, is kind of exciting, um, but that's because the cause of the major disease through disease. Okay. So I'm not going to think about lifestyle stuff, um, although as we'll see, some of these things actually are swapped by diseases. Right? 
And so, yeah, I'm talking about how many people the disease has killed. So that's, that's my specific measure. And I just want to acknowledge the complexity of that because that's not always the best measure. Okay, so, yeah, many tropical diseases, as we said, people do not kill. Um, uh, there's many other measures, like the, the colleagues of the dailies, um, like infectivity, so how, how, how likely are you to catch the disease, um, how bad is it for you, uh, what's the prevalence, and so, yeah, how many people are affected. Um, I mean, in, at the end of the day, the extreme example, if I have a disease but it doesn't really affect me or kill me or disable me, do I really care? Right? And so basically, you know, if some, some parasite wants to live in my body and doesn't really affect me too much, right, maybe that doesn't matter. Right? So, and, and then of course, kind of have some continuum of sort of you know, in, impact beyond that. Um, and we're also going to ask the question, and spoiler, the answer is a disease, what's the worst disease that you've ever encountered? And by the way, the worst thing you've ever encountered. Right? So the, the worst thing that humans have ever faced, as we'll see, is one of these diseases. All right, so let's try and guess number 10. Um, and I've sort of provided a little, little factoid for kind of guessing here. Um, so. This was a disease that um, was very prevalent in the British Empire. So some of these diseases are older, and some we still have with us. Well, actually, let me ask you a question first. How many diseases have we eradicated? One. One. Two. Three. Four. Five. More than two. So the answer, the answer is two. Right. Smallpox. Everyone knows about smallpox. Right. Smallpox was eradicated in 1980. Well, it was officially declared eradicated in 1980. Probably eradicated in the late 70s. Right. Uh, smallpox was eradicated because there was a vaccine. So, in fact, it was the first vaccine. The vaccine was in I think, 1790, 1791 or so. Uh, Edward Jenner was uh, a doctor and he, he, he noticed a very peculiar fact. He said, Well, everybody has smallpox. Right? Yeah. You know, we all have 10 kids because seven of them are going to die of smallpox. Right? That's just how it is. Right? Smallpox is a thing that everybody gets and either survive or you don't. Everybody's got it, people are scarred and so on, except for one group of people. There's one group of people, actually quite beautiful people because they have no scarring, and these people don't have smallpox. And these people are milkmaids. I said, why do milkmaids have no smallpox? And he investigated this for a while and realized, oh, it's because they're catching cowpox. And cowpox is a perfectly benign disease to catch. So it's basically, it's a, you know, it's a disease in cows. And milkmaids are working with cows very closely. They're catching cowpox all the time, but it protected them against smallpox. Right? And he said, well, why don't we give cowpox to some other people and see what happens. And so, now, this was back in the day before we had medical ethics and so on. So he did this great demonstration in the town square. And he said, he, he took a 10-year-old boy and said, I will inject him with cowpox. And then he injected him with smallpox and he didn't die. So he said, look, it works. And everyone went, yeah, fair enough. Okay, we experimented on a small child. Yep, life is good. Okay, so that basically invented the vaccine. And the word vaccine comes from vache, which is French for cow. Right? basically giving you a cow disease instead of a human disease. Now, as soon as the vaccine got underway, there was an immediate anti-vax movement. The anti-vax movement has been around as long as vaccines have been around. Nobody likes vaccines. It's like paying your taxes. Nobody wants to do it, even though it's really good for you. Right. So, well, who were the, the first anti-vaxxers? They were doctors. Doctors hated vaccines. Vaccines were taking their livelihood. Why would doctors be on board for vaccines? Right. Doctors were like, do not vaccinate these people. That's our job to you know, basically treat them. And, care of them when they come in. And so doctors really had to be educated and they had to have a concerted education campaign to say, okay, no, no, we, you, you can embrace this and you can actually make it part of your protection. And it took a long time to do this. And, but eventually doctors did come around. And of course, now doctors are on the side of vaccinations. So that's now part of their job. But these things don't happen gradually. It's not like, oh, vaccine, you're a cure, we can stop you. Right? You have to actually engage. And at first, well, lots of people got the vaccine because they're like, oh yeah, we all see smallpox and you know, everyone's lost to see children to smallpox. So everybody got the vaccine, well, not everybody, lots of people got the vaccine, right? And then, you know, for a while, people were getting vaccines, no problem. And after a while, the smallpox really went down. So that's is great. They continued to get the vaccine for a little while. And then after a bit, people said, well, why are we getting this vaccine when there's no smallpox around? So they stopped getting the vaccine. That's all right for a little while. Then the smallpox comes back and then people start dying. Right, well, okay, now we better get the vaccine. And so what you see is these waves of smallpox happening and waves of vaccination with a nice delay, perfectly symmetric, it's you know, a beautiful mathematical pattern, very tragic to watch, right? Because people have very short-term memories and people fundamentally are not good with hypotheticals, right? When you tell something to someone, 
Some people can process that as, a, as an idea, and most people cannot. They need to see it, and they need to suffer it, and people need to die before people even begin to do anything about it. And that is a very sad act of human nature that is not, not you know, consistent with any one time. This is in the whole of human history, we're always like this. Right? So, what you see is for 200 years, the smallpox waves do this, and they very slowly start to diminish. Right? And the vaccination rates go up and down and up and down. And then, towards the very end, what happened? Well, now, most people are vaccinated. Uh, the last British outbreak of smallpox was in 1962, I believe. Um, and so that was um, a traveler from Mecca had, had come and uh, arrived in the uh, right by plane, um, had infected I think, four people on the plane, um, and then there was an outbreak in Bristol, an outbreak in Wales, um, and so there was like you know British panic, you know, whole, whole towns were quarantined, you know, hospitals were overrun, you know, and, and, and of course at this point by the 1960s, lots of people had been vaccinated, except lots of people also hadn't, um, and particularly the, the the guy who'd come and been originally infected, um, he. He didn't want the vaccine, so you know, he, although he was legally supposed to have it, um, where he, he'd grown up, he managed to avoid it because lots of people did, you could bribe your way out of it. Right? So lots of tragedies happening because people are you know, making their own decisions. And by the end of the smallpox campaign, they basically said, well, smallpox is almost gone. And the last of the smallpox was in the former Yugoslavia. Um, and they said, we need, to, we need to get rid of this. And we have a real chance of getting rid of this disease. And a lot of people said, we don't want the vaccine. And they said, too bad. They sent in helicopters, they sent in the military, and they forced vaccinated whole villages. They said, we don't care what you think, we are vaccinating you, and this is the end of the story. And it worked. Right? This was a great strategy. It got rid of the smallpox forever, almost, and smallpox was done and gone, and, and all, this, all this good. Uh, now, that's a lot harder to do these days. We have a lot more individualism happening than we did even back then, and people say, well, I surely have the right to choose what I do. It's like, yeah. And also, I mean, there's a trade-off between individual versus the group, right? Me as an individual, if I don't want a vaccine, do I have responsibility to not infect people in my society? And the answer varies depending on the, the cultural conditions, right? When there's a massive outbreak, there's a plague and so on, you know, laws kind of kick in, you know, with emergency structures and so on, and you may not have that right anymore. Um, and there's arguments as to whether it's a good or a bad thing. Okay, so, what's the other disease we've eradicated? No, that's still around. Polio. Well, polio, no, that's still actually polio, polio. Polio doubled in number recently. Um, they, thought it, they thought it was gone, but it, it jumped back up. Um, actually, because again, um, this is a vaccine. Um, uh, I'll give you a hint. It's not a human disease. It's an animal disease. Uh, you probably don't know it actually. Um, so, in all of human history, we've eradicated two things in humans or, and/or animals. Right? So you think surely we can eradicate animal diseases? We have way more control over animals. The animal doesn't get to say, I don't want a vaccine, the animal just gets vaccinated. Um, the answer is rinderpest. It's a cow disease that we eradicated in 2011. Right? So that's you know, nine years ago now, but that's pretty recent. Right? So we, we doubled our number in the last decade. Um, that, that's kind of cool. Um, rinderpest is one of those diseases where they basically sort of, you know, they use quarantine a lot. Basically, you know, cows in this field, cows in that field, but they realized, well, they knew about quarantine for the black plate, but they, they basically said, well, you know, if we keep the cow separated, we can control the rent pest. And it was pretty good at that, but it was also done through a vaccine. So the two diseases we've eradicated were both somebody invented the vaccine. Right? And this is great. Vaccines are really cool, but you have to you have to wait for somebody to invent one. Right? So sure, I'd love a vaccine for HIV, but there isn't one. Um, and so what do we do in the meantime? Right? And the answer is there's lots we can do in the meantime. Now the great McGinney worm disease, one of the reasons I love it so much, is because the, the intervention methods are all the soft science stuff. It, there is no vaccine, right? and yet the idea that we could eradicate a, a disease using behavior changes alone, I think is going to be very powerful. So I think that's going to kind of tell the, the next step in disease eradication stuff. Because we can apply the idea of behavior change to control a disease to many other things. You know, it does rely on people doing the right thing. That's, that's a hard one sometimes. Sometimes people will do the right thing, they'll do the right thing generally when it's in their interest to do, and they won't do it if it's not. And you know, media comes in, and media can sometimes help, and can sometimes hurt. There's lots and lots of factors, but, but there's a possibility actually that we can, we can do stuff. Okay, so let me talk about number ten. Right, number ten is syphilis, right, which we don't really think of as being a hugely prevalent disease now, um, but it certainly was back in the day. And there was syphilis all through the soldiers of the British Empire. Um, uh, one of one of the kind of tragedies of HIV now um, is there's a myth that says that um, if you have sex with a virgin, then it cures your HIV. 
Now, this is absolutely not true, and of course, you very likely infected that virgin, right? but it's a myth, and there's, there's a myth through a lot of Africa that, that you know, if you infected the virgin, okay, well, how do you, how do you find a virgin? Right? Well, you can ask them, but babies, yes. Right? So if you have sex with a baby, surely that's going to be a virgin. Right? So this is a massive tragedy. So if you have sex with a baby, then you're going to, you're going to be cured. Right? So there's a lot of people having sex with babies, and depending who the baby is, that baby may not even be a virgin at the time. Right? So there's, there's all kinds of horrible things going on. But it turns out, this was totally from colonization. This is exactly what the British soldiers believed. Right? They basically just passed it on. Right? They believed if you had sex with a baby, you would cure yourself of syphilis. Right. So we see these terrible tragedies happening through the whole of human history, and I think one of the real problems is that people really need control. Right? They need control over things that are not necessarily possible to control, right? and disease is one of those things. We have a lot of cultural practices because people are basically fumbling about trying to figure out, okay, what is it that will protect me? Right? And without knowing things like, you know, how does a virus work, and, you know, back in the Middle Ages and so on, right? well, people turn to the church and ask some questions, and, told answers whether they were true or not. Right? This is often true in various societies today as well. And people say, okay, well, you know, if I you know, adopt clean practices, or I adopt kind of, you know, moral practices, or, you know, when it's a sexually transmitted disease, if I do certain things or not other things, if, you know, the people who are straight or gay, I, you know, if I'm not one of those people doing those things, therefore I'll be safe. That may or may not be true, but we start to believe it, and then we get stuck in these things. And this is where culture really gets affected, right? because, you know, fear is a very powerful driver of things. And so it's very sad, and if I step back a bit, it's very interesting watching society try to grapple with disease. And, and it's been grappling with diseases of different kinds for a very, very, very long time. So all kinds of stuff has happened, sometimes for good reasons and sometimes not. Okay, so syphilis has killed about 10 million people. All right, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna also give the numbers as we count down. This is a lot of people. Right, now, these numbers are not always 100% accurate and probably underestimates of anything. Um, uh, and one of the great things is we can treat syphilis now, so that's awesome. Right. So if you have syphilis, you know, you, you see some symptoms, you go to your doctor, you say, oh, I've got this, you know, nasty looking thing, and they say, oh, here's a prescription, and you can treat the syphilis. So this problem basically solved, except because nothing's ever truly solved. So it's still floating around, there is still syphilis. Actually, there was, there was a massive syphilis outbreak in college communities about 10 years ago. Um, why is this? Because in, in the 80s, when HIV came along, Everybody was, was petrified and said, okay, I've got to you know, practice safe sex and so on and be very careful. And as the kind of fear of AIDS started to recede a bit, it's not like it went away, it's still around. But there's treatments now, you can't cure it, but you can, you can slow it down and you can you know, live a full life on treatment. So, so people start to realize, okay, well, it's not the worst thing in the world, so maybe I don't need to use condoms now. Right? And so condom use you know, had gone really up after the AIDS epidemic had started, and then it started to decline, and it hit a, it hit a crossover point where now condom use is now lower than it was just before the epidemic, and so people are not using condoms, and condoms are a great protector against many diseases. And so syphilis started to reappear, it can be treated, but of course, it's, you know, I always say, it's better to have a fence at the top of the cliff than an ambulance at the bottom. Right? You can treat things, but you're way better off not going over the cliff in the first place. But, you know, people sometimes have to make their own mistakes. All right, so number nine, the disease was originally called GRID. Does anyone know what that one is? HIV, yes. GRID stood for Gay-Related Immunodeficiency Disease because when it was first discovered, it was in uh, late 1980, and what they found was that um, all these gay men in San Francisco and New York were dying of diseases they shouldn't really have. Right? They, they didn't see a new disease. What they saw was these old diseases popping up that they didn't really think were circulating, and well, it turned out that's because there was another disease that was eating away at their immune system. And so it meant you had no immunity to things. And what was discovered was we knew nothing about what we thought we knew. We thought we knew about the immune system, and we didn't. So when HIV AIDS came along, all kinds of new information came out. Right? And so one of the things was, well, what the immune system does is there's, there's the B cells and the T cells. And so the B cells, they create antibodies, and these antibodies attack virus directly. Now, if you have a new disease that you've never seen before, you have no antibodies to it. So the, get the measles or something, you have the measles and it starts infecting you, what it's doing is it's getting into your, your T-cells and what well, gets into various cells, but often gets into the T-cells, and the T-cells then become this laboratory for a new virus. So, so you get one virus enters your, your cell and then it creates many, many, many copies of itself. So thousands of viruses now come out of your cell. So your cell becomes a little, little laboratory and so you need to kill the cell as well as killing the virus. So the antibodies can kill the virus if, if they know about it, 
but they have to load a better dose. So then what usually happens is you're, you're infected with the new virus, it gets into your T cells, creates many copies of itself, because they go and take other cells and they create copies. But at some point, the immune system says, well, oh, we've got to do something about this, and it, it both kills the T cells, um, so it has these killer cells that come along and basically envelop the T cells and destroy them, uh, but it also has to remember what those are so it can deal with them, and it, it communicates with the B cells and says, okay, we've got a new virus here, like, we know what it is, the B cells, you know, we tell them about how to kill it, they create antibodies, so the next time you get this disease, then you can fight it off. So we all fight off the measles all the time, right? So we all catch the measles a lot. It's just that our antibodies fight it off. So you get a tiny little infection, you don't even notice, you don't have symptoms, right? That's correct. There's measles circulating all the time, but if you've either had the disease or you've had the vaccine, you, you don't notice this. Right? In fact, the circulating measles is probably helping us a lot because it's keeping our immune system primed so we keep developing new antibodies and fighting it off. So sometimes it's dangerous if you completely eradicate a disease, like smallpox. If smallpox came back, right, then we would not have immunity to it. Right? And even, well, it seems like even people who had it sort of, you know, 20 plus years earlier, that immunity may have faded. So, so you, you know, basically restart the problem again. Well, yeah, I did say before that the smallpox wasn't quite gone. Uh, when it was, it was eradicated, they um, said, okay, we, we wiping this thing off the planet. And uh, the US government said, yeah, we'd like to keep a sample just in case maybe for some bioterrorism you know, experiments and so on. Um, and the, the former USSR said, okay, well, if you're doing that, we'll do that too. So they kept two samples, and so the US has one, and the USSR had one, and when the USSR fell, they lost the sample. So that, that went out into the wild, and no one's really sure what happened to it. Now, I suspect that if somebody really had it, that would have been used by now. So it's probably gone, but we don't know. And they actually, they really had a chance, and the USSR said, you know what, we'll get rid of ours if you get rid of yours. And the US said, no. No, 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 you never know, you might just need it. And so, you know, again, you see all kinds of stuff happening, and you know, people saying, well, you know, I might want to do this. Um, they also sequence the genome of smallpox, so we could potentially be recreated. So I think this is a terrible idea, right? I think, you know, what could possibly go wrong with, you know, one of the, one of the worst things we've ever had. Um, but this is, this is how, how life is. And we have to kind of, I think we have to adapt to the systems that we have. All right, so HIV AIDS, uh, that has killed 36 million people, and it's done it since the 80s. Um, and, I mean, that's, that's very fast. That's a lot of people in a very short amount of time. Um, uh, so, oh yeah, sorry, so I was saying that the, the, um, the, the immune system has these two parts, and there's particular cells that the HIV AIDS wipes out are the, are the cells that communicate between the two sides of the immune system. So, the immune, the immune system has a lot of backups, a lot of redundancies, but it doesn't have redundancy for these this memory cells, which basically tell the, the B cells how to fight new viruses. And so if you take those out, then new things come along, and the, the immune system doesn't know what to do with it. And so then people start dying of you know, these, these you know, 13th century Borneo flus were turning up. Like, where, where did this come from? This flu hasn't existed in ages. Oh, we discovered that it has existed. We all catch it. We all deal with it quietly every day and get rid of it. And so it turns out that all the all these invisible diseases nobody knew about, right? and they were coming out in, in people with AIDS. And so, so AIDS is specifically when you have a, a, you've lost a critical mass of immune cells, and so therefore you're, you're unable to fight off viruses. So yes, that's that's I'd say it's very very tragic part. Um, now there are things we can do. Right? We don't just give up. There is no vaccine. It's very very hard to develop a vaccine against HIV AIDS. Uh, part of the problem is that the virus the virus is very simple. Um, uh, so when when this came along, the central dogma of genetics said DNA can unwind to become RNA. So, so you have two strands of RNA make DNA. And so DNA can unwind. That's the central dogma of genetics. Well, HIV is two strands of RNA that combine to make DNA. So they actually, they call this reverse transcriptase, so that the, the RNA gets into the cells and it basically transcribes itself into the cell and makes, uses the machinery of the cell to make DNA. And this is just reverse, only because it's reversed our thinking. Right? We didn't know this was even possible until this came along. Other viruses do this as well, we've since discovered, but you know, this, was, this was brand new thinking. It was like, oh, okay, we don't know anything. We had to basically throw out the book and start again when this disease came along, because it did such, such bizarre things. So it's got these very simple strands, makes DNA, uses that to create copies of itself, and then it unwinds them, and then, and then sends out the copies. Um, but the, there's kind of, there's a tipping point with any species, viruses, you know, animals, whatever, which is basically lions versus rabbits. And so, where should you put your energy into? Should you make lots and lots and lots of offspring like a rabbit, right? And of course, many of them will die, but you hope you create enough of them that some will survive. Or, you become a lion, and you put all your energy into making one really good one, right? And so, you know, a single lion is a very powerful thing, right? Because if you take that line out, you've done a lot of damage to your species, right? relatively speaking, compared to, say, one rabbit. And there's a tipping point for every species. So they just basically they fall on one side or the other. And HIV is very much the rabbit of disease. Right? It just creates lots and lots and lots of copies of itself. 
And I mean lots, like in, in a single infected person, in a single day, you have 10 billion virus particles that are created, right? 10 billion, right? That is a massive amount of virus that's happening, and most of them are pretty useless, right? You make all these mutations, because HIV is so stripped down, it's so simple, that it doesn't have an error checking capability. So when, when measles creates copies of itself, it makes these, these copies and then it, it checks, basically the mother virus makes sure the daughter viruses look exactly the same as it. And if, if there's errors in the DNA, it will fix them. And so that's why measles is a very uh, consistent virus. And so the, the, the offspring looks like the, the parent. The problem with HIV AIDS is there's all these mutants. So there's a main strain of the wild type, so that's circulating in your body. If you can treat that one, which you can, great. Well, very quickly, the mutation will arise because there's so many mutants around. So the chance that a mutation will appear that will, will you know, evolve around any treatment you have is pretty high. Um, so it turned out they had to invent three different drugs. Um, this was done by mathematicians, actually, because they said, well, the, the chances of a, of a mutation occurring around a single drug is basically the probability is almost one in a single day. So that's not going to work well. And it didn't. Um, they, they released drugs in 1987. Those drugs basically failed six months later. Because people were not going to take the drugs. When, when nurses were giving them in hospitals at exactly the right time, exactly the right amount of drug, everything was fine. And as soon as they went out into the world, people you know, missed some and you know, took breaks and you know, just did them a bit randomly. And the virus mutated, and then of course you pass on a mutated virus. So they said, well, let's have two drugs. They said, well, that, that gives you a bit more time. Um, with three drugs, though, the, the chance of mutation was actually quite small. And so they said, well, okay, now we've got a solution of sorts. It's a triple drug cocktail. We have a cocktail now of many drugs, and so this, this is able to kind of hold back HIV. It doesn't cure it because this mostly treats HIV in the blood, and HIV hides in all kinds of different places, and so it, it you know, goes past the blood brain barrier, um, so it gets into the brain and the eyes, it's in the testicles, it, it hides in um, other cells, it attaches itself to certain places that it can't reach by drugs, so it's not a cure by any means, but you can deal with a, the vast majority of the, of the virus, um, so you, you reduce it down below a detectable level, but if you stop the drugs, then it, it bounces right back. Okay, so there's no cure, yes, but these, these drugs basically can prolong life, reduce transmission to new people, um, and you can also get behavior changes happening. So behavior changes have happened, people study their condoms a lot, um, people stop sharing needles, um, uh, there's, there's, there's drugs which are not curing people, what they can do is they can do great things like they can stop infected mothers passing on to their babies. So babies essentially inherit the immune system of the mother, which they have for a little while. So even though the baby's basically got you know, a HIV positive mother, it, it kind of washes out the immune system. Um, but during the birth process, the, the transmission often happens, a lot of blood and so on. Um, but you give the mother two doses of nevirapine, and you can basically stop transmission to the baby. And so you know, it's been said there should be no HIV positive babies born in the world at all today. Of course, they still are. So you also need access to those, those drugs. So the, the drugs of uh, Bill Clinton actually did good things. He, he, negotiated for, for either cheap or free drugs almost everywhere in the world um, for things like this. So, so that is easy to, to do. The problem is it comes from the breast milk later. And so babies pick up the breast milk and then it passes in. Um, well, there's you know, possible solutions. There's people why not don't use breast milk and let's have formula. And formula needs to be water. That's not always available. Breast milk is a great thing. It's a very freely available, easy product. Right? And they say, well, okay, we, we need to do breast milk. What we can do is they realize actually the breast milk is fine for a little while. It's when the baby starts on solid food that then it, it um, breaks the lining of the stomach. And so now the, the stomach starts bleeding internally and the, the HIV positive breast milk then passes through. So I said, okay, new plan, breastfeed, 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 stop, never breastfeed again, and switch to solid food. And so, you know, again, if you can understand how these things work, you can find solutions. Um, some of very clever solutions like this. All right. Uh, so, number eight, uh, this had a fairly recent outbreak in Zimbabwe. Um, anyone know what this one was? I think Haiti as well actually had recent outbreaks. So, this is cholera. Uh, actually, I called this one myself once. Uh, this is the only one, the top ten, it's the only one I've called. Um, I called this in Uganda and it's not pleasant. Uh, I thought I did have the vaccine. There is a vaccine against cholera, but it's a weak vaccine. It only works about 60% of the time. So, obviously, I was in that 40% where it didn't work, but I probably had some partial immunity. It wasn't pleasant, but, but it was survivable. Um, and also, being a Westerner, I also had to back up pills so that I could take pills. So it was very unpleasant. My colleague and I were really sick, but we took pills. You know, basically, you have to you have to replace your, your lost fluids. Right? So this has killed about 40 million people. Right? Um, and you can basically treat it very simply with a saline solution. You basically just need to replace all the lost fluid. But if you don't do that, you're going to basically like you know you're just you're sweating, you're peeing, you're, you're 
losing fluid at a faster rate than you can replenish, um, you're going to die from that. Uh, yeah, and also there's the partially infected vaccine. Um, that, the problem with some of these vaccines is, of course, they're not they're not widely distributed. They're you know for people like me who are travellers, who can sort of you know you can control the vaccination of those people, but not not on a widespread scale. Okay, so yeah, this disease number seven um, killed more people than World War One. Okay, well, many diseases have done that, um, but why specifically World War One? Does anyone know what this one is? Spanish flu. Spanish flu. Yes. Yeah, Spanish flu. Why is it called Spanish flu? Did it start in Spain? No, it did not start in Spain. It started in an army barracks in Kansas. All right, so where did that come from? Okay, well, the reason is because it started during World War One, Spain was not involved in World War One at that time, and hence they did not have immediate blackout. So Spain is reporting that there is a you know, terrible new flu that's killing people, and most of the countries are not reporting this because it's wartime and we're not we're talking about such things. And so they said, oh, there's a flu over in Spain. Well, it turns out it's everywhere. Right? And so uh, this was a, another big kind of cultural impact on things. So if you wanted to go to the grocery store, what you would do is you would write your list to what you wanted, and you would you know, approach the door, you would slide your list over there, you would step back, and the person would take the list, they would assemble a little you know, care package for you, they would put it there, they would, you know, Give the money, you would step back, take your stuff. There was no human contact, you're not wearing masks and so on. Right, here's you know, a picture of sort of just vast hospital beds. Um, the particular strain of, of flu is uh, H1N1. Uh, we had an outbreak of that in 2009, um, uh, which is Spanish flu, uh, sorry, swine, swine flu. And swine flu didn't kill 50 to 100 million people, um, largely because a lot of us, well, some of us, have some immunity. Um, now, it tends to be that these epidemics kind of pop up every so often, and all the people are really helping us out. All the people are getting this, surviving, and keeping the rest of us somewhat, somewhat uh, protected. Um, but as all the people start to die off, then there is less immunity around. So you get these kind of waves of epidemics happening. Um, and there was an outbreak in 1957 um, in Hong Kong, so that, that also provided some immunity. Um, so, yes, the, there's been further outbreaks. Um, uh, now, in 2009, there, there were some technological advances, right? There's machines that can breathe for you. So, so when you go to hospital and you're on uh, some respirator, right? That machine is basically breathing for you while your lung is repairing itself. So all those people who survived because they're respirators, they would, of course, die from Spanish flu outbreak. But in the scheme of things, there weren't that many. There's, so, you know, in some sense, we probably got a bit lucky. You know, there's other mutations of the flu, of course. So we get, I mean, we get the seasonal flu all the time. We can say, ah, I got the flu, I've been sick, and I survived. Right, now, people die of the flu all the time, but generally they die because they have a weakened immune system. So, either because they're elderly, um, or very young children, or people with immune uh, compromised positions, so HIV positive people, for instance, or other diseases where it's, your immune system is not so functioning. Um, and yeah, this, this for many years was, was known as the, the invisible epidemic. They, they, I mean, a lot of people were dying around this time. Um, part of the reason that, that this was so, so bad, so it started this army barracks in Kansas, and of course, people moved to. European trenches, and humans were moving at an unprecedented rate. People are, you know, moving around with troops, movements, and so on. And also, they're in pretty filthy trenches and so on. So, yeah, really ripe conditions for a disease. Right? But the movement allowed it to really spread around the world. Right? And as you saw, you know, it spreads all the way in the northern hemisphere. Six months later, it's the exact replica in the southern hemisphere. Right? We can, you know, stop that really at all. Now, we are now moving at rates much higher than what happened then. Right? And we're not usually living in such filthy conditions. Well, most of us, uh, but still, there is much more movement, and movement is really great for disease spread, right? Because if I'm infected, I'm infecting people near me, right? So if I'm, you know, have an airborne disease and I'm breathing on you and there's a pen mixing in this room, we're all likely to be infected. And if we're not moving around too much, then we can have a chance of containing it. But if, you know, just like say Dr. Lewis Sewer, it's right, you know, one politician decides to get on a plane and fly somewhere else, take a train to London or whatever, and then restarts the infection locally, and it starts spreading around, somebody else jumps somewhere else, right? And, and in Dr. Lewis you really see exactly this happening of like kind of local spread, a jump, local spread, it jumps to, jumps to Paris, I think, at one point, and it spreads around there. Now, this is exactly how computer viruses work, right? Pick a random ISP, infect locally around there, jump to a new random ISP, start locally infecting there. Really good design for, for a disease. So basically, notice what's happening for a lot of disease spread, and we're able to you know, create a similar thing. All right, so let me go to number six. Uh, this is a disease for which they make a quarantine, because they realize that if you keep infected people away from susceptible people, you can stop infection. You want to play exactly right. Yes. So, actually, sorry, it, well, it's a version of the plague. So this is actually the Justinian plague. This is, this is an you know, old, obscure disease. Um, this was, you know, 541 AD. Uh, this killed 100 million people. Now, I'm just doing sheer numbers. 
I'm not doing proportion of population, but if I was, this one might be a little higher. Because we didn't have quite as many people back then. 100 million people was a lot of people. It's killed a huge amount of people. Um, now, I'm breaking up plagues into kind of distinct, kind of named plagues. If I combine them, of course, it's going to be a bit higher. Right. So, yes, yeah, so I will get to be one plague, but this was the Justinian plague. And this, this was kind of one of the, the sort of very early kind of outbreaks where people were kind of like, yeah, okay, we need to do something about this. And they realized that city walls made a big difference. And if you get the, you know, the, the outsiders out and the insiders in, you can stop disease happening. Okay, well, all kinds of stuff flows from this, right? And people start to realize, yeah, those outsiders, you know, the filthy outsiders who are trying to get in my city, uh, you know, I need to do something about them, right? So you get a lot of prejudices get built in. And sometimes with a, with a good basis, that those, you know, that thinking doesn't always apply after the disease is gone, right? And so you get a lot of stuff where people start to you know, really, you know, try and control their world and hence try and control other people and so on. Right? But it was noticed that you could, you could stop this disease by basically walling things off. Right? Quarantine is a good solution, right? If you could just basically take people out. Right? So if I'm infected and I can't infect you for a while, right, until I recover or die, then you know, you, you've solved that problem. Right. And yeah, this can be treated with antibiotics, so it shouldn't be too much of a problem now, or sometimes it is, but it's, it's mostly something that, that we can handle. Right. So we've made lots of advances over the years. Alright, so number five, a disease we successfully eradicated from the US, but alas, we didn't hold on to that. So I heard polio and measles, measles is correct. Uh, polio is not in the top 10. Right. So polio is not a fun disease to have, but it's, it, the numbers are not that high. Um, uh, polio, so polio, there is a vaccine. Uh, the problem with the vaccine for polio is, is the vaccine can also infect you with polio. It only, I think it's, it's not huge numbers, but we've mostly eradicated polio, and about 15% of all polio cases now are vaccine derived. So this is the problem with the final push to eradication. You're saying, well, but why would I get this vaccine that's more likely now to give me polio than I am to get polio if I don't do anything about it? And that's a reasonable argument in some sense. And you sort of have to say, well, you have to kind of roll the dice because we need to get rid of polio. Um, and on a, on a community level, that's very sensible. On an individual level, it's a very hard sell. Um, also, there were specific anti-polio um, movements, um, particularly when Osama bin Laden was captured, it was done under the guise of polio vaccination. Well, there is no polio vaccination anymore in Pakistan, right? Because, like, you know, it was basically seen as, well, the US is using polio to, you know, to cross lines they should cross, so basically they, they would start uh, killing vaccine workers and so on. Um, and in Nigeria, one of, the, one of the states in Nigeria said no, no vaccines here, vaccines cause AIDS, no vaccines. Right. And, and it was always gone, and these two spots basically said no around the same time, and I think between 2013 and 2014 it doubled the number. So it's, it's very sad. We actually thought probably it would be the next one to be eradicated, and it looks like that's just not possible now. Um, so yeah, this one is measles though, right? And I mean, I think a lot of people think about measles as like, yeah, I had measles as a kid, I survived, what's the harm, right? You just get it and you survive. Well, a lot of people die from measles, right? 200 million people died in the past 150 years. I mean, this is, this is a lot of people died, a lot of children died. Um, it's very tragic. And I think this, this is one of the sad things, that people are not, not good at looking outside their tunnel vision. It's like, well, I was fine, so therefore it would be fine, right? That is just sadly not the case, right? Um, uh, we have a vaccine. Uh, the vaccine works very well. Um, it's you know, I'd say very highly effective. But most vaccines are not like the smallpox vaccine that just stops the vaccine completely. Most vaccines have a degree of effectiveness. The measles vaccine has a very high degree. The problem with measles is it's very, very transmissible. Right? So most diseases, when you're infected, you have a chance of transmission. So let me play a little game with you. Right? I'm going to be infected, so I'm standing up. Let me infect two people. So I'm going to infect you and you. So stand up because you're infected. Okay. So now I'm done, so I'm going to sit down. Infected people point to two more people and infect them. So now stand up if you're infected. Sit down if you're now recovered. So all, all, yes, all people sit down, new people standing up. So now we, we have one, then we have two, we have four. So now everybody infected two people. Okay, so now sit down if you're, if you're done your, your disease course. So now we start infected. So infect two more people each. So now, the status is disease. Okay, can all, can all sit down. All right, so now, first it was me, just one, right? And then I infected two people, they infected four, then they infected eight, 16, 32, 64. Well, we don't think we have 64 people in this room, right? So what happened was we started to run out of infe infections. Um, actually, I noticed some people didn't, didn't quite do the infecting, or you could 
infect somebody who's already been infected, right? Maybe they have immunity, maybe they don't, right? Two infected people might try to get the same person, that's possible. So, so you don't necessarily keep doubling, but you certainly, the initial spread from me to two people, that was very effective. From two to four was quite effective. Then maybe it starts to fall off a little. It's still spreading though. Right? Now, what if, it, what if it wasn't quite so intense? What if it took 10 people to infect nine, and then nine to infect eight, eight to infect seven? Right, so there's this number, it's called R0. It's, it's, um, it's in the movie Contagion. Right? It's, the, it's called the basic reproductive ratio. Right? It's, it's the ratio of how many people are, are infected from a single index case. So the number here was two. So I infected two people, they infect two, they infect two, and so on. Now, I assume, of course, when I'm infecting you, there is, nobody has any immunity. This is a wholly susceptible population. So it's effectively measure of disease spread. I mean, you care for demographics. You know when they say, like, you know, each couple has, like, 2.3 children? So if you're replacing two people with 2.3, your population is growing. In Japan, I think that number is about 1.8. So you know, two people are producing 1.8. So all in Japan is a, is a crisis of births because there's a lot of young people. That kind of demographic replacement is the same idea with disease, except instead of couples producing children, it's, it's individuals producing new individuals. Now, most diseases have this, this, this ratio of about 1.5 to 3. Right? So, you know, if you have a disease you're affecting three people, you know, then it's nine, and then it's 27. That's a very fast moving disease. The number for measles, though, is 17. A single child in a school, if nobody's vaccinated or, or has any immunity, that single child will infect 17 people by the time they recover. Right? So, 17 kids get infected. Now, each of those kids infects another 17 each. Right? They think the measles spreads like wildfire. That's why it's a really hard disease to contain, even though we have a very effective vaccine. So the net result is we need everybody, almost, to be on board with this vaccine. And that is just not happening. Right? There's been pushback about vaccines. Um, there's, there's myths about vaccines called autism, which are complete myths. It's based on false research that has been completely debunked. It's been provoked by everybody who was involved. Even the lead guy who spent years kind of being like, no, 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 and was clearly kind of a whack job. He's finally actually said, no, you, yeah, you're right. I did take my research. Right? Even he said it, and the anti vaccine movement said, oh, he's a, he's a seller, he's a traitor. Right? What's, what's happening here? People need control, right? You know, they're seeing rates of autism go up and they need somebody to blame. That's very human, right? Vaccines are an easy target. Nobody likes getting them, right? But the best solution for me is if everybody else is vaccinated and I'm not, right? That would be great because I don't need the vaccine then. Everybody else is protecting me. I'm going to do all around myself. The problem is if everybody thinks the same way, nobody gets vaccinated. And you see the same idea as a smallpox way is happening. So, sadly, what's going to happen? A lot of people are going to have to die before people start to say, oh, maybe we should get the measles vaccine. And the same pattern will continue for a very long time until we finally eradicate this thing. It's, it's the sad truth of history. All right, uh, so we're at number five. So let's go into the top four. I know I've heard lots of, lots of diseases called out um, before. We've hit some of them and not others. So let's go to number four. All right, ah, this is the first bio event. All right, it's number four. Uh, anth anthrax, anthrax is, is relatively recent. I mean, it is natural forming anthrax, but it's not that deadly. Uh, SARS, uh, SARS, SARS, SARS is an interesting one. SARS came along, it spread very effectively because of the transplant networks, and we got rid of it, right? We basically eradicated SARS through just basically... Black plague. Black plague, yes, you're correct. Yeah, right. So the black plague, uh, black plague killed a lot of people over a very long period of time. Um, now, I said it's a bioweapon. How did they invent a bioweapon back in the day? Catapults. Yes, catapults. Right? They tossed dead bodies over the walls into the city. And the Genghis Khan did this. Right? So Genghis Khan, you know, who's you know, the, the ancient ancestor of most of us. Right? So, you know, he, he did a lot of stuff in history, right? So, you know, fathered a lot of children, and he also, you know, killed a lot of people. And so, what happened was the Mongols had surrounded this, they, they were pillaging across Europe. Right? And, and we knew they were coming, and this one city that had very good defenses that said, we're, we're going to hunker down, we're locked in, and we're staying here. And the Mongols came, they just couldn't get through the city walls. They said, ah, we can't get them in. And they just stayed there. It was basically a standoff, and the city inside went, we're, we're good, we, we've got supplies, we're going to wait them out. Um, and they said, we need to smoke these people out. So there were dead bodies that they just tossed over the walls. And they said, okay, now there's all these dead bodies in your, in your very small enclosed space, and the dead bodies started to infect people, and this is where the came from. Right. And then you know you get things like the plague, you know, was was carried by, by fleas, to living on rats, but people thought it was witchcraft. So said, well, you know, the witch is familiar as a cat, let's kill all the cats. And cats of course control rats, so more rats, right? Um, you know, turned to the church and said, you know, what should we do? And of course the church had no idea. The church at the time was very powerful, and so people believed them, they, the church 
interested to do something, people did it. Um, and what happened was people would do the thing, and then it wouldn't solve the problem, and then we're dying. So the, the plague actually, in, in some part, broke the back of the church as, as a very powerful organization. It went away, but it, it wasn't as powerful afterwards because they actually didn't have the answers. Um, another problem with Black Plague, of course, is it's kind of killing all the, all the poor people, right? Particularly all the workers, right? All the serfs who were working in the fields, now all the lords have people that work for them. So what do they do? So let's go find some other people. So they did colonization. So let's go, and go elsewhere and grab people. Bring them from another place because they can be our workers, right? So you see massive societal changes in responses to disease. Right? So this killed about 240 million people. Um, we can mostly treat this. Uh, now, there is a neurological strain that we cannot treat. Uh, now, the neurological strain, if you get it, you've got 24 hours and then you are dead. There is no question about that. Right? So, that one, when it pops up, it kills people very quickly and then those people actually are not sick for long enough to transmit the disease. So, the neurological strain is not really a big problem unless you've caught it, but you know, then it's all over for you. So, mostly it's fine. Now, this strain still circulating pop up every so often. Um, the recent outbreaks in the city in India, also Madagascar, I think last year or a couple years ago, um, it's still around. This is tragic. Could be treated like we see. You know, I mean, most diseases, after a while, they, they get out of the rich areas and into the poor areas, right? And people then stop worrying about them too much, right? And so, people who are in poverty, right? Uh, people who have brown skin, people who are you know, in the warm regions, don't have power, don't have money, they tend to just have to live with the disease. Right? When you have an outbreak happening, for something like here, oh, we have to deal with that. Now we sometimes do, sometimes don't. Right? But, you know, for example, when Ebola was happening, and it was all this in the US, we need to deal with this, and of course, the vaccine was invented pretty quickly for that. Right? But if it's just a problem over there, well, there's a lot of incentive to do that. And this is, again, a real tragedy. And even if you think just selfishly, like, well, you know, I personally don't want to die of a horrible disease, it would be good to invest in another place to say, why don't we treat people over there and stop, stop me getting infected. Australia did this. They, they realized there was a lot of TB happening, and most of the TB was coming from outside. So, so Australia, handing back the plague. So, so it's right here. The very north, there's Papua New Guinea, and in Papua New Guinea, there's, there was a lot of TV, and there are, there's islands in between Australia and Papua New Guinea. Um, it's, it's fairly close, so you can, you can get in a boat and you can easily just row sort of between these islands. And there's a treaty which says anyone who lives in these islands has right of passage to, to enter any country. So, so the, there's Torres Strait Islands, they can go to Australia, they can go to Papua New Guinea, there's, there's no, no order uh, for them. And so they were just bringing the TV back and forth. And so they said, well, it's hard, to, it's hard to get all these people once from Australia, but we can get to them in Papua New Guinea. So they, the Australian government built hospitals in Papua New Guinea specifically to treat TB. It was a great project. And they said, okay, actually the TB rates went really down. And then there was a change of government in Australia, and the conservative government said, why are we wasting money on another country? We should be investing money in our own country. They cancelled the hospitals, what happened? The TB all came back. Right? So again, you see these you know, very complicated, short-sighted political decisions that are having big impacts. Um, yeah, similar thing was done for, for SARS. It was like, why don't we invest in, you know, what's happening in China to prevent stuff happening here. And, and even if you think selfishly, it's still, it's still kind of happening. Yeah, this, this is very unfortunate. Okay, let's go to number three. All right, well, I think we know this one. The first vaccine, that was smallpox. All right, so how many people did smallpox kill? A lot. Uh, 500 million people, half a billion people. That was in the 20th century alone. All right, so that was probably much, much larger than that. Um, and this is the only human disease we have successfully eradicated. I hope this changes very soon when guinea worm disease kicks in, but in terms of sheer numbers, guinea worm disease is very minor. It doesn't kill anyone directly. Right? So, although that would be cool because I think it would provide some impetus for other diseases, right? this was a massive achievement. Right? This, this, was, this was really amazing that we got the vaccine. Okay, so I've talked a lot about smallpox. Um, all right, we've got two to go. Can we guess what the next two are? Okay, I've heard the correct answers happening. Yes. <laughs> okay, all right. So, what order are they coming? Oh. Louis Braille died of this one. I don't know this is a kid. I don't know how much people Louis, Louis Braille, obviously met Braille, he was blind. Uh, he, he died of this. My grandmother also died of this, actually. This was TB. Right. So, TB, uh, the TB is one of the, they call it one of the big three. Um, so, malaria, TB, and HIV, uh, these are the big three diseases. These are the ones that kill most people largely in, in um, developing countries. Um, so TB has killed a billion people. Right? There's a lot of people who died of TB. Right? So this is a lung disease, and it you know, makes it hard to breathe. Um, now, there is a vaccine, 
sort of. So it's a partially effective vaccine. You can treat symptoms with antibiotics. Right? Certainly, when I was a kid and my grandmother died, but we all had to be vaccinated, we had to be treated. Um, so as far as I know, we didn't get TB, but we can go to the hospital all the time. And it's over a, a fairly long period. And the problem is sometimes people don't take their antibiotics. And you have a, you have a course of antibiotics you're supposed to take. And it's this long. If you miss the last couple, it's like you never took any of them. So, so you have to make sure people take their drugs. So they have a thing called DOTS, which is directly observed treatment strategy. And so they basically say, you have to come and I have to watch you take your pill. Right? So you have to really make sure people do it. Um, and there's real problems with this because people don't like taking pills and they sometimes miss them for whatever reason. And that, like HIV, can cause the virus to mutate. Um, and so there are, there are resistance strains as well. Um, and if you go to a hospital in you know, Africa or somewhere, and you have, if you're HIV positive, many people are, and you also have drug resistant TB, they will not let you out of that hospital ever. Because you will die in that hospital, but you'll probably die in about two weeks. If you have this combination of HIV plus drug resistant TB, right, you are a walking death trap because A, you're going to die really soon, your immune system's being compromised, you've got a really bad strain of TB, they can't be treated, and you're very likely to transmit that TB to new people. It's, it's now drug resistant, which you can transmit, so that's, you know, person who gets it, you have brand new TB that's you know, drug resistant already, so they can't be treated. If they're HIV positive, you basically get this terrible cascade. Um, so this is very unfortunate. There was a case recently of a, of a guy who had drug resistant TB, and he was, he was, he was from the US, and was trying to get back into the US, and, and they, they banned him, and so then he, he, he went elsewhere, and he came out through Canada and managed to sneak across the border there. He said, well, I had to get to my wedding, and so on. And they were like, well, you know, <laughs> like, this is what you see, right? You know, people of privilege are, you know, able to circumvent the system and find ways through. This, this guy was this you know, rich guy who's like, I'm also what? I'm gonna, I'm gonna get there. And he's like, you are a danger to everyone. And yet, uh, you know, he's fine, he gets around the system. Um, I, had to be, I had to be diagnosed with um, a check for TB when I, when I grew up in Australia, so when I became a Canadian citizen, um, they wanted to make sure that I didn't have TB. So, okay, fair enough. I've been living in Canada for six years at that point. They didn't test me when I first arrived. All right, so they're sort of doing this kind of disease monitoring, but not that effectively. Okay, so number one, the worst disease of all. Well, I think we know what it is, I'm going to call that is malaria. Right. So, now, TB killed a billion people. How many people has malaria killed? Yeah, yeah, you guys are all being very conservative in your numbers here. 50 billion people. That is a lot of people. Right. So, this is the worst disease of all time, clearly. Right. This is 50 times worse than the next disease. Now, malaria has been around for a long, long time. Most diseases are not. Most diseases are relatively new. Mostly diseases pop up when we started working with animals. Right? Diseases tend to jump from animals to humans. Right? HIV AIDS jumped from uh, macaques and chimpanzees to humans. Um, it's not entirely known how, although there are some very strong theories. Um, because it, it popped up kind of in regions of Africa, kind of all over Africa, almost simultaneously. Because, oh, there must be some conspiracy here. For somebody's released this disease and we're going to try and kill people. That's possible, right? Although, that takes a lot of work. Right? On the other hand, it was also noticed that, well, why in these two different strains of poppins, HIV-1 and HIV-2, which came from two different animals, and at the same time, it was noticed there were a lot of missionaries going around vaccinating people against other diseases. And usually it would take blood and, and still the thing, but they actually took the blood from chimpanzees and other blood from macaques, and they're just, you know, basically using that to, to store the vaccine in, and then they were vaccinating people, and they went all around Africa in a very similar pattern to where this disease popped up. And so they think this is just a, just a sheer tragedy, that, that these animals have SIV, which is semi emitted deficiency virus, and SIV does not cause any AIDS equivalent in, the, in their animals. They just have this disease, you know, compromise their immune system a bit, but they're basically with full lives otherwise, and when it jumps from animals to humans, suddenly our immune systems just weren't that good, and it, it seemed to kill us. So it seems like it was just a, just a sheer random tragedy that happened, and we kind of did it to ourselves by accident. And a lot of stuff happens by accident, and, and people, I think, are very keen to promote conspiracies about, like, oh, there must be some plan. It's like, oh, I admire your optimism, I admire your faith in humans, that you think that, that, you know, like, people can actually put it together to do this. But mostly stuff's just incompetence, right? And we see just accidents happening all the time, that's just mostly how stuff happens. But again, we as humans have a real need to impose control over things, and conspiracies are a great way of doing that, right? Because we don't really have any power, so let's just think our way out of it. That's, that's good enough, that mostly works. Right, so we see that happening with diseases all over the planet. All right, so here's another question. How many people have there ever been? 50 billion people have died. What's the percentage? How, how many people has malaria killed? Yeah. Um, now, there's good news about malaria. So I'll reveal that answer for the next page. So we think about that for a bit. Um, so there is a vaccine. 
it's, it's, it's coming. Um, it's gone through almost all the testing. They're building vaccine centers now. It's very likely there's going to be a, a malaria vaccine soon. It's not a perfect vaccine. It will protect some of the time. It will also allow you to be infected, but then maybe it's less bad for you. And particularly, malaria mostly kills children. It's mostly children under five. Right? And the other is if you can basically push back the, the, the date of death before five to after five, then the natural immunity means you, you tend to survive. So the other is you hold it back enough that then people can survive. Right? It's not a perfect solution, but it's, it's not a bad solution. Um, other things they've been doing is they spray for mosquitoes, and well, you need to find mosquitoes. Where are the mosquitoes? I'm sure they're in the swamps and forests and stuff. Yes, but you can't really spray those very effectively. But there's a really good place to find them, which is after they've bitten you, they don't go very far from you. Right? The mosquito that's bitten you is very full and heavy, full of blood. It tends to go very close. Actually, they will go in your house and just rest somewhere nearby. So they spray your house. Right? They spray your whole house, kind of inside and outside. And OK, maybe it's too bad for you because you've been bitten, but you, you stop the next people being infected. And so that's an often effective way. And then they've, they've had a good bed net program where they basically say, all right, bed nets for children. And these bed nets are treated with some insecticides so the mosquito even lands on the outside of the net. Bed nets always get holes in them all the time. I certainly slept on a bed net where the mosquito is inside the bed net and you can't get out again. I'm like, oh, I cannot get to sleep. And there's a really deadly mosquito floating around in here. And you know, I can get off without the bed net maybe. Um, and all kinds of cultural stuff happens. Like people say, oh great, thanks for the free bed net. I'm going to use that as a fishing net now. Right? Now this is treated with an insecticide. You probably don't want to be eating out of this thing, but people don't have nets and they need to eat. Right? So you may die of malaria in you know, a couple of years, or you may die of starvation next week. What are you going to do? Right? Of course people are going to use this as fishing nets. Right? So you have to think through lots and lots of unintended consequences. Okay, so malaria has killed 50 billion people out of how many, how many humans have there ever been? 110 billion. Malaria has killed almost one in two people who've ever lived. All right, that's that's a pretty pretty arresting statistic. All right, so 50% of us died. Now, what this really says is actually back in the day we all died of malaria. Uh, everybody died of malaria. So this is this is a big one. People are dying of malaria now. I mean, okay, why are we dying of malaria? Where's the malaria gone? And the answer is, well, was it was it never here? Or was it was definitely here. I live in Ottawa, which is about as cold as this place, and at the Ottawa the canal that was dug, there's this memorial that says, you know, to all the soldiers who died of malaria digging this canal. Right, so in places, you know, as cold as this gets, there is malaria in the summer. Of course there's malaria because there's mosquitoes. Assume you have mosquitoes in the summer. Right? If you see mosquitoes, you see malaria. Right? Well, you did anyway. So where's it gone? What happened to it? And then there's something did happen to it. Right? And, well, here's, here's my exciting news. Mathematicians. Mathematicians figured this out. So in 1911, Sir Ross discovered that malaria was caused by mosquitoes. This was a huge breakthrough. They thought it was just kind of, if you, you know, they thought a swampy vapors. If you go to the swamp, you get malaria. That's true, that's because mosquitoes live in the swamp. So yes, there's a correlation between swamps and malaria. But he figured out, no, it's, it's precisely caused by the mosquitoes. Okay, this is a great breakthrough. You want a Nobel Prize for that. And people got very depressed. They said, there's no way you can kill all the mosquitoes. Even if you wanted to, we don't want to do that. We know they really want the ecosystem. Right? So you don't want to kill all the mosquitoes. And a few years later, some mathematicians came along and said, you don't need to kill them all. You just need to kill a critical mass. Right? And in fact, this, this measure of disease spread that I was talking about before, if you can reduce that from being greater than one to less than one, you could, you could eradicate the malaria. Right? Basically, you stop the disease expanding and make it start shrinking. They said, well, all we need to do is just kill enough of them. Um, after the Second World War, they invented DDT. And DDT was a very, very powerful insecticide. Um, you, you would paint your wall with DDT. Nine months later, a mosquito would land on the wall and drop dead. Of course, it gives you cancer. Of course it does, right? But you're going to die of cancer in 30 years. You're going to die of malaria next month. So, easy trade-off, right? So, yeah, DDT is a very powerful thing. And then what happened? Well, people said, great product. Let's use DDT everywhere. It stops all kinds of insects. So let's use it for crop dusting. And like, you know, instead of loading planes of DDT and just, just spraying more, you know, DDT all over crops, because it was killing all the pests. They said, well, this is great. Um, but then it started, you know, doing things like devastating all kinds of things in the ecosystem. Um, and so, you know, eagle's eggs were too thin to, to you know, have viable eagles and stuff like that. And this started the environmental movement. Environmental movement is a direct response to disease control. Right? So diseases, as we see, have a massive impact on the world. Um, and the environmental movement said, we need to stop spraying all the DDT everywhere, as they were right. But of course, humans are not good at kind of nuance. And so they said, well, okay, yeah, all right, let's ban DDT. Right? So they banned DDT. What happened? Malaria came back. Right. They had almost eradicated malaria for the whole world. They got rid of malaria from all the Western countries. They put it down into pockets. It almost disappeared. And then they stopped dealing with that. So malaria basically bounced back. But it bounced back in a way that it effectively remained in the tropical regions. 
right? And so then they said, well, we want to be the big problem that isn't, so let's just not worry about that too much. And so now we see we're stuck with a lot of people dying in there every year, but they're, again, not the people with power, right? So you see these shifts happening, so because we don't have to deal with it, it doesn't get better. Now, what the warming is changing is, because the warmer it is, the faster the speed is grouped, right? Every, every day that the egg is experiencing more than 8 degrees Celsius, right, even if it's underground or something, the mosquito progresses slightly more towards its birth. So basically, the warmer it is, the more mosquitoes. Right? So if we're spraying to control malaria, well, then we have to spray faster. We use more resources, more chemicals, faster and faster and faster, just to stand still because it's getting warmer and warmer. Right? So this is another problem. So there's all kinds of stuff happening, all kinds of knock-on effects. Okay, all right. So let me just kind of finish up. All right, so where did malaria go and why? Well, that was disease modeling. Right? So mathematical models plus treatment. Uh, now, there are other treatments. Those treatments are not as powerful, so the mosquitoes have started to evolve around them. So it's an arms race. We keep inventing new products. The mosquitoes keep evolving. Who's winning? Basically, the mosquitoes. Right? So that's how it usually goes. Well, we have good technological advances, but they run out after a while. Right? So I'd say many of us are still alive because of mathematics. So I think that's a, that's a pretty cool achievement. So I think that's pretty much where I'm going to stop. Um, I will say, if you're interested in more information, uh, you can check out my website. The QR code leads you to the same link. Um, I, this, this picture here is actually people drinking through the pipes. Um, so this is nomadic people. You can sort of see the, the string, the little white string they've got there, as the, it hangs around their neck. So, and look at that water. That's pretty dirty, right? So this is a good kind of general health kind of thing. OK, so I will say thank you very much for your attention. I don't know what time it is. I have to leave. It's almost time. Okay, alright. Well, I'll tell you what, find me in the corridor if you want to ask me more questions because I'm always going to do that. Actually, I'm going to be signing autographs out there, so come ask me and that'll be fine. So thank you, thank you very much.